Yeah, it's amazing. I didn't know I had that power. It's just everyone's just... <laughs> um, whilst those of you at the back are getting seated, um, my name's Michael Riley. I'm guest curator of the exhibition here, Beyond the Baseline, which is fantastic. Um, if you haven't seen it, it will be open until, I think, 9.30 this evening. So as soon as this ends, there's a whole series of other events taking place. Please uh, stroll across to the other side. But no extra cost. So let me begin. <clears throat> Tonight's event uh, with George the Poet and Guest is one of the highlights of the program, accompanying the British uh, Library's exhibition, Beyond the Baseline, 500 years of black music in Britain. Those of you who've not visited or revisited the exhibition can do so tonight, and if you just head over, which I've just said, it'll be open until 9.30. George is also doing his book signing uh, later, so you might want to uh, purchase a book first <laughs> to do that. Um, <coughs> And if that wasn't enough, uh, also, over at the entrance, we'll have a brilliant showcase of live music with next generation R&B artists, uh, Callie Clear, Indigo, Marshall, Ten, and Ashley Zeal with a live band. So there's lots going on this evening, and it's all part of the same ticket price. So, <clears throat> uh, yeah. <laughs> and it's Friday, so there's no rushing home to... <laughs> right. Um, joining Georgie on stage, We'll have the legendary, I made the mistake of calling him Tinsy Strider because I'm old, and he went, yo, T.S. So just, <laughs> so just remember that. Uh, we have Chantal Kali, we have Shaisti, along with lead curator of the exhibition, uh, Dr. Alima Gray, my colleague. Now, do you know about who Tinsy Strider is? Sounds like I should explain. Um, Tichi is one of the founding members of the Rough Squad who originated from uh, Bow. And for those of you like me from Birmingham, that's part of London. Um, uh, it's also part of the legendary uh, grime crew, Roll Deep. But it's also solo artist, he's, as a solo artist, where he made the biggest impact, starting with the independently released album, Star, in... Um, well, Star in the Hood in 2007, and going on to uh, three chart-topping singles uh, and an album, and as he reminded me backstage, and a number one. Um, we also have uh, Chantel Cali, or I was reminded, Shiesty, or Shy, uh, is also going to be on stage. Uh, Shiesty is a rapper, songwriter, and actress who rose to fame in London with her response to Dizzy Rascal's I Love You. Uh, dubbed. She's a first lady of grime, signed to Universal, uh, who paved the way to female artists, uh, artist rappers. Uh, she toured at 50% 50, 50 uh, G-Unit and Basement Jacks, and released her debut album, Diamond, in the Dirt in 2004. She made gaming history with her first UK artist. She made gaming history as the first UK artist with her own character in a game, which I think that deserves a round of applause. That's, that's a big deal. Um, <clears throat> uh, released on PlayStation uh, and Xbox in 2005, her Channel 4 TV series, uh, Dub Plate Drama, ran for three seasons, blending music drama with an interactive format that influenced shows like Black Mirror. As an actress, uh, Chanel also starred in films like Legal, uh, Activity, Adulthood, 90 Minutes, and Dirty God. She was also modeled, uh, she also modeled at London and uh, New York uh, Fashion Weeks. Most recently, she conceived and will leave, she conceived and will lead in an upcoming new drama show currently in development with Fremantle. So really, really powerful female woman coming up. Female woman, what's that? <laughs> woman coming on stage. And then last, it's Friday, it's Friday. And then last but not least, George the poet himself. Do I need to endure it? No. No, no. That means you listen to his podcast. Thank you, okay. so. 
without further ado, let's bring on our superstar panel. And whilst they're coming on stage, come on, roll on, come in. <laughs> um, Whilst, they, um, whilst they're getting seated, I'd just like to say what's important about this exhibition and Beyond the Baseline is that we're telling our story. And in terms of storytellers, uh, we, all, we often look at those individuals as uh, different or separate from us. But it's important to understand that one of our most accessible storytellers is our musicians, it's our poets, it's our artists. And their stories are part of our history. And in terms of our history, they are the curators of that history and we're grateful to them. So thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Blessings, thank you very much for the warm welcome and thanks to my esteemed panelists for blessing us and allowing us to have this conversation today. For those of you who don't know, my name is, why don't you know? My name is George <laughs> Um And I have recently released a book called Track Record. Anyone heard of that book before? Anyone have any idea that I dropped a book? Yeah. Yeah. All right, all right, cool, cool. So Track Record originally started off as an autobiography um, and I started it in 2020. Now, as I'm sure you'll remember, it was an eventful year. <laughs> um, not long after I literally signed for the book, the pandemic kicked off, and not long into the lockdown, um, George Floyd was executed. This changed a lot for me and forced me to expand the scope of my book. So I ended up telling not just my story, but the story of some of the processes that led to me being who I am and speaking from the vantage point that I do. Now, the people to my left are key people in those processes. Um, Shiesty, uh, Shai, Shiesty, Chanel. Anything, Shai. It's all good. <laughs> Shai was um, one of the key people um, at the inception of Grime. O obviously, uh, you heard Michael mention earlier, the first lady of Grime, a very clear voice in the early days of our new media space in the form of Channel U, which was pivotal to allowing us to tell our own story with our own aesthetic. Sha was one of the first people with a professional looking music video, did I tell you that? <laughs> Didn't, but thank you. Your thing looked <laughs> clean, I couldn't believe it. Um, and of course, she was early in the game getting signed. I didn't even know artists from our world were getting um, record deals at the time when she did. So she's foundational, as is Mr. Tinchy Strider. Um, I was telling Tinchi earlier that I must have been in year six or year seven when I first heard his name, and he weren't that much older. <laughs> he was 14 years old. Um, the word was that there was a 14-year-old that was in Roll Deep, um, and anyone who remembers that era knows that Roll Deep was a pioneering group from the grime scene. I mean, um, Roll Deep's frontman, Wiley, is said to have really invented grime, you know, um, and I've written quite a lot in my book about how the moment I discovered Wiley's music and then Roll Deep's catalogue and the world of pirate radio, the world of um, home studios, that was really the beginnings of me becoming what you now know as George the Poet. Tinchy Strider was um, pivotal at, at that time because he preceded a wave that um, took over Grime, which was called the Youngers, the Youngers mm -hmm. wave kind of set in, I would say, from 2007-ish. Um, but Tinchy was um, active before that, from 2002, uh, rapping with people in the... Sorry, bro, 2001. <laughs> That's going to happen a lot. <laughs> but, yeah, 2001. <laughs> and, um, yeah, rapping with people that were way older, holding his own and showing a lyrical versatility, a confidence. He was tiny, by the way, like, <laughs> um, so to be... <laughs> 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 
To be physically, so, so you know. I've, I've grown a bit. <laughs> I know, yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't tiny, I was tinky. It was tinky. Now he's tiny. Grew into... Tiny. All right, cool. Um, <laughs> told you it was going to happen. Uh, but, yeah, uh, to have established a presence as a visibly young person, that was, um, that was a, a breaking of a seal that there was no going back from. Now our rap scene is dominated by teenagers. It's just normal. Mm -hmm. And um, Tinchi was a pioneer in that. Now, Dr. Alima Gray, uh, has anyone heard of the Beyond the Baseline exhibition, which the uh, British Library is putting on? Yeah. Come on, come on, come on. Yeah, no, make some noise. I had the honor of having a walkthrough um, with the brain behind the content of that uh, exhibition, uh, Dr. Alima Gray. Um, I, there's no doing justice. Uh, the, what I was saying to her after walking through the exhibition was that I, I wasn't prepared. <laughs> and I'm someone that stays immersed in talking about black consciousness and black music. But um, obviously the exhibition considers 500 years of uh, black music in Britain and the depths that they've gone to, not just to organize key stories, key figures, but also to create a physical experience that they built to, you know, um, embody the story that they're telling. Unprecedented. It made me feel like I want a new job. <laughs> I'm, I'm def I've definitely got a lot to learn from you guys' process. So, Dr. Alima Gray, as well as putting together um, that exhibition, she is an authority on uh, the historiography of Rastafari. As someone who grew up as a Rasta herself and came over to this country quite young uh, and had to navigate all of the cultural difference that that ensued. She has now completed a doctorate where she's arguing not just for accurate storytelling when it comes to Rastafari, but storytelling from a Rasta perspective with Rasta methodologies. Now that is key. This is where her work overlaps with mine. As I document in my book, when I look back on my grime years, I realized that that was our way of telling our story and it was powerful. I went to Cambridge University and I came back to the community only to realize that my real education happened in those years, in those radio sessions, in those studio spots, in those playgrounds, bus stops and street corners where we used to commune in order to tell our story through this new rap form. Mm -hmm. So for that reason, as I said, these guys all represent different components of the things that made me the commentator that I am today. So let's just have one more round of applause. <laughs> so one of the key themes that um, we've talked about and I really want to get into when it comes to our music is this element of DIY. We have a do-it-yourself culture. And um, I've always imagined that it came from us coming from communities that were not linked in with the state and we're not flooded with private funding. So we ended up having to get it cracking on our own. Now, Shia, obviously, you guys had the TV show Dub Plate Drama, <laughs> um, which was, it was centered around the pirate radio scene. Yeah. Can you try to tell us what was the story that you were capturing through that, through that show? So I started off, obviously, as a grime rapper. So I didn't have no experience in acting or anything. And I remember we was coming back from one of my performances and my manager was driving and he's just like, would you like your own TV show? So I was just like, of course. I'm like, yeah, 100%. Because I've grown up in Hackney in a council estate. So even just coming to where I've got to, I'm like, a TV show, that's crazy. So I said, yeah. And so I met up with the director, Luke Himes, and he was just like, just tell me about your experience as a female artist, a musician. So I sat down with him, we wrote loads of things, and then he based the lead character, which I played, um, just off my journey. But obviously you've got to embellish things. But it was just ba basically, what is the pirate scene like, mm. the grime scene like, what is like the culture, the lifestyle, everything? Like, what do you have to go through as a female in a male-dominated scene? Mm. So I was just telling him, and then I remember we prepped for this TV show, and I'm like, oh my God, we're having a TV show, it's gonna be on Channel 4, this is crazy. 
and I specifically remember the day before we was gonna shoot, I was in the car with the director and my manager and we was like, gas, we was like, oh my God, we've done it, we've done it. This is crazy, we're gonna be on Channel 4. And I was like, guys, I've never acted. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, I've never acted. And they was like, oh shit. And they turned around, they was like, I was like, guys, <laughs> what is going on? We haven't, I've never done no acting classes. They was like, oh my God, like, because we've been so busy just trying to get this TV show going. <laughs> They totally forgot, and I'm just like, what am I gonna do? And they was just like, just pretend it's a music video, just pretend it's a music wow. video. Yeah. You've done your music videos, like you know how to act in front of the camera, just mm. be yourself. So I was just like, okay, cool. And then the next day we was on set, there was like 100 cameras everywhere. They'd got like your AD, everything. And I'm like, just this is a music video, it's just a music video. <laughs> but we done it mm. and um, because I am a musician and lyricist, I just picked up like the script so easy. So I could just like look at the script and it's just memorized. So I was so grateful that I learned that from being a musician. Mm. So I just transferred oh. like my music skills into acting. And then it was just like, yeah, it was just being on set with like your friends. I, the director was like, do you know any musicians that want to come into the show? So I was like, yeah, I've got this friend, Adam Deacon. Like, he messaged me, he's like, Shy, I heard you're doing a show. I'd love to be in it. Can you get me in it? I've got him in it. We got um, Skepta. And it's so funny how grime is so um, influential because this is not even made up. I don't know who this guy is at the front, but he's got a Boy Better Know t-shirt. Boy Better Know. <laughs> and that is literally from some of the guys that I've come up with from when we were 17 years old. They made that brand and this guy is just wearing it. So yeah. that's how crazy Love like that. grime is. But um, big up you, innit? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so, oh, yeah, so um, we just done the TV show. It was about Pirate Radio Station. Um, and yeah, like I said, like how I come up in the scene just in a male-dominated scene, how it was different for me, like getting on radio stations, on the pirates, and the guys are like hogging the mic, so you've got to be confident, you've got to like take the mic as mm. well with confidence and rap with them, like mm. the Tinchies and all this. And I feel like grime was so foundational for making me who I am because it made me confident. It made me um, want to just step out of my comfort zone and try other things. Um, become an innovator in different sectors or things that I didn't even think that I could do type mm. of thing. So, mm. and it's taken me across the world. Like, I'm just so grateful that I mm. stumbled mm. into music. Mm. Sorry, I, I bragged on. But... No, <laughs> no, come on, man, no. this is, there's so much to say. Yeah. Um, there's a few things I want to tease out from there. So, yeah. a word that you just used, innovative. There's, there's so much innovation that is involved with Graham. So just to look back on the story that you just told, mm -hmm. you guys had already established yourself as you, you was a music act, right? Mm -hmm. And in that, you had to learn how to do studio, make, yeah. you know, write songs, memorize songs, ready to move into the world of TV. Um, your peers have clothing lines, boy better know that are gonna like live on yeah. in 20 years time. That's great, that's 20 know. years. That's, that, that's real, wow. that's, a, that's 20 years old. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's another element that you mentioned. Um, just just the, the, the mechanics of putting a TV show together, mm -hmm. a collaborative project as well. Yeah. One way that I always um, express it to people that weren't there at the time is, if you, if you said to the, what was it, Blair government at the time, we have these spaces, they are estates, and they're filled with um, energetic, innovative, creative young people who have a passion for... Uh, expression and you know they're, they're really locked in they have these tight networks what can we do with all of this cultural potential they couldn't have come up with a better mm. plan than what we did in Graham mm. yeah and this was organic and we were so young mm. like we was like Tinchy was mm. 14 yeah I was like 17 mm. and I just remember the boys in school teaching me how to like rap and write lyrics and do it together and then from then they would be like come to this um, yeah. this rave. Yeah. So then now you're just on, on a stage in front of people just like this. This is the first time you've never done it. And they're just like, go on, go on, just spit what, what we done, <laughs> what, yeah, what, yeah, what, yeah. what you know how to do. And then you're just doing it. And then your confidence is getting bigger and bigger as people are cheering. Mm. You're getting reloaded. It's like, mm. this is crazy. And you're just doing this like at 17, like you're traveling around with your friends. And right. 
your parents are like, they don't really know what's going on. They're like, you shouldn't really be studying because I don't know what this is. But they're just letting you have a go, letting you have a go type uh -oh. of thing. Um, and yeah, you just have to, I remember I had to get the tapes when you're um, recording, like yeah. to send off your tapes to try and get in with like whatever pirate radio stations mm -hmm. and stuff like that. I learned so much, man, seriously, <laughs> just like... DIY? Yeah. yeah it's just I would like to, to anyone um, who's not familiar, I would like to give them a little sample of what you were doing at the time. Uh, could we please hear Shiesty, uh One Wish? Oh. Mm. <laughs> You know what? Wow. That's, do you know what? That's crazy. I wrote that when I was like 20, and I remember I was at my friend's house in South London in this council estate, and my friend Postman, who made the beat, I was just writing it, and it was like the first song that I wrote for my album, and I just wrote it, wrote it, went to the studio and recorded it, and because you're just like I was so young at the time. I had like so much aggression. I'm just like ah, like and Tinchy just said you can hear the I can aggression. Hear it. I can hear it. I can hear it. And I remember we sent like the first draft to the record label, and it was like oh, this is a bit too aggressive. I had to re-record it like about four or five times oh, wow. because they were just like. So that's the toned down version. That's the toned down version, and that's wow. still, that's still aggressive. But yeah. Amazing, amazing, and it it um, brings me nicely over to um, to UT. Right, so as we've already established, um, you were in, I think, two of the most foundational, legendary grime uh, crews. So, Rough Squad. In fact, let me uh, tell you the story that we got, like, outside. Okay. So, I'm from Northwest London. Grime was born in, in you lot's home, East London. Yeah. Bo. Thank you. So, <laughs> <laughs> never, take it, never take it away from Bo. Um, and yeah, so there was Roll Deep. Roll Deep was headed up by Wiley. Um, and I think they were either on one side of the estate or one side of the neighborhood. And then there was Rough Squad. And we heard that it was a crew of like Ghanaians. Is that true that you lot are mainly Ghanaian? Majority is Ghanaians. Okay, so but that was. You know what? Majority is like, it's mostly Africans. There's one, we had one Jamaican. <laughs> <laughs> one, but we're all one, I guess. But. Literally, it was like, it's like all our mums knew each other as well. Okay. Yeah. It's like, you know what's the thing, like, when you're, there's a thing where it goes like, oh, hi, auntie, everyone's yeah. your auntie. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, again, it's really key about the networks of um, uh, uh, community that we build and that are natural to us, which reveal themselves in new ways as we grow up. And now we're rapping, so, you know, that, these youths that I used to kick ball with or mm. used to go to school with, now all of a sudden, we're linked in a different way. So, yeah, we heard that there was Roll Deep over there, there was Rough Squad over there, and you lot used to rap a lot, and you were just like the golden child. Mm. Around the same time as Dizzy, but you were even younger than Dizzy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I don't know, what, how do you remember it? It was, for me, you know what, before, hello, everybody. <laughs> yeah, no, nah, it's like, um, I don't know, I guess because I was young, but when you're that young, I, I thought, this is, I love MCing, and my brother was a DJ, we shared a room. So, like, my mum somehow allowed everyone to come make house tapes. I thought, mum, and she like, it's okay, it's okay, you're not outside, it's not safe yeah. outside. Mm -hmm. You're inside making music. Yeah. Cool, then yeah. writing lyrics and getting on pirate radio, it's like, there's different levels to pirate radio. So I thought, okay, um, we're trying to get on that. Like, I guess Rinse of Femme somewhere, roll deep, pay as you go, there's on there. Yeah. You can't get on there. We thought, have we got to start on the smallest? <laughs> but it's all pirate, none of it's legit. So I thought, <laughs> we get, we're, getting, we're getting there and they write lyrics and everyone's writing bars, but what kept us going is that, Obviously, like in house competition. So, like, I'm like, I got this new bar, and then I hear you one. I right, cool, I like it. I come back. I came on. That's how we kept getting better, better. And then I thought, like, a bit, I go to other places and MC, and then I'm like, people know my lyrics. I'm like, how? Mm. I don't, even before I get to that stage, even like, like Shasti was saying, when you're writing bars, say, I didn't know what's, what's a four bar, what's an eight bar. I thought, okay, I write a four bar, repeat it. That's eight bars. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. And then, and then you hear some other MCs, they got, 32 bars and they're not repeating one line. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm like, wait, hold yes. on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, got, you got to say, for example, Kano, you might do a 64 bar. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, bro, I got four bars that repeats. <laughs> but, yeah. but then I realized that when you go to the raves, that's the one you get reloads. Really? So, but the aim is to, who's going to get the biggest reload? Who's mm. going to get a reload? And so you start getting reloads from house tapes to like pressing up vinyls yeah. yourself. Like, like you said, the DIY. reload is like when the Re audience yeah. demands when, that you oh, start. Sorry, yeah. 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 Reload is like when everyone loves it, everyone goes crazy and then. 
rewind it, and then you're like, okay, so what now then? Yeah. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, but no, they like you, they like you. I was like, God, maybe because I was the smallest one I've was, but I was like, I was nervous, but somehow confident. Mm. Yeah. I step on stage and always people's, why you got your hoodie on? I said, well. I'm hiding. Yeah. I'm pretending it's cool. It's, it's, it's not. I'll just, I'll just share. <laughs> I picked up the mic and I just say my lyrics, lyrics, and then bit by bit it kept building, building. So and a lot of pirate radios and youth clubs was key. Mm -hmm. Go to different areas. We're from Bo, East London. We had one like link centre. A lot of people come from other areas to come to our youth club. Mm -hmm. Before, why everyone's coming and said this is where it's at. Roscoe's here, but roll deep. But they're older than us, so they don't come to youth clubs. Mm -hmm. Dizzy did though. But this is a couple of years older than me. Mm. And it was cool with children and everything. But I thought, I love music, man, but I don't know, like, what's the what's everyone always making us hype about? We like MC and we say lyric, you go crazy. Okay, what what's what's the aim? Mm. I kept going, kept someone told me, no, nah, you lot got something. You lot got something. And then luckily in for fact, me, before you forget yeah. that, so you're not thinking about career at this point. No. You, you're just, you just enjoy rapping and yeah. it's getting a reception. Yeah. That, that was a special thing, because we didn't think, oh, career, like, career, like, oh, like I keep saying, true. before I even get to that stage, you see, like, music videos, I used to watch a thing, how do people get in the TV? Mm. Like, <laughs> <laughs> how, do you, how do you get in there? Like, I thought, mm. I don't care about that, it's like MC, and I like, you go to this youth club, mm. a few people get reloads, reloads, and obviously, yeah, people like it. Oh, you're the small one, one rates you. Girls like you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, so, but what? Because I'm saying that. <laughs> saying that, I thought, I'm going to keep doing this. <laughs> like, when you come, like, you got to get, like, say for example, you're saying DIY, you got to, like, be, know what you're doing. OK, I want that beat, I want that beat. And my friend said, nah, bro, there's no times about 20 MCs. Yeah. When you get the mic, like, shout to saying sometimes, like, you know what, everyone's what's the mic putting their hand down. But I'm like, when someone's on the mic, you might not want him or her to come after you. Yeah. If they get a reload... Or before you. Before you. Or if they come before yeah. you, if you're like, wait, what do I say? Yeah. He just got a reload. I might not be good enough. Yeah. <laughs> but then I thought, my older brother told me, nah, your lyrics are good. It's just that you're, like, you're, you're smart, like you pay attention in school, so you're writing some lyrical, technical lyrics. <laughs> They don't want to hear that. They want to hear the simple thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I thought, okay, 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 but I thought, like, why do I don't want to just cut down and say, nah, honestly, try that. I said the lyric and then, like, everyone started getting crazy too. I thought, oh, okay, yeah. this thing's easy. Yeah. <laughs> then I went to other places, like, going around, circling. We're, we're from Bow, so East London, about, say we go to Stratford, mm. Hackney, different places in East London. I thought, then when you go to, like, say, for example, North London, mm. You think, yes, I've made it. Mm -hmm. I've travelled, you didn't go too far. <laughs> you got a bus, you yeah. got like five stops and yeah. you're in. <laughs> so I thought, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, yeah, I'm making it, I'm making it. That kept me going. Nah, but don't going. downplay it because as at that age, yeah. to, to age, first yeah. of all get past your friend group and yeah. then past yeah. your neighbourhood yeah. yeah. and into another part of the city. That's, that's, yeah. that's the yeah. special thing about it because it was happening, but I didn't realise it. Mm. So that's what kept me driven. I thought, you know what, I just love this. Like, mm. I live in right, I'm big over there now, I thought. Yeah, two people know my lyric, okay. Then I went to a rave, I said the lyric, I thought, whoa, whoa, they know me. <laughs> I want to keep doing this, keep doing this, keep going, keep going. But like I said, there's so much, but if I forget from remind me, please, because my brain's like that, I'm always thinking so far ahead. Yeah. I forget about now. <laughs> you know no, what I mean? but, there's, but, but so much has happened. So much, We're so gonna much. We're going to forget a lot. Yeah, yeah. Even like, even like um, I, I've spoke about Pirate Radio, but like I said before, Pirate Radio, like Shaiti said, say the tapes. Mm. You do house tapes and then you record it. People come there, record the tapes, record the tape. You listen to people on Pi Radio, you record it on the tape. My brother's got a little tape that I take and record over it. You yeah. might be like, what happened to my tape? Yeah. I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. You play it back, you play it back. And then for me, like you're saying, when I was so young, so when like I went to secondary school, I love football. That's why I play football. I mm. thought, yes, I'm going to be a footballer. I'm going to be at that. I said, yeah, but you're good at MCing. Mm. But, and when you go to school, everyone's got, he's good at this, he's good at running, he's good at, mm. he's good in class, he's good at fighting. He's good. I'm like, nah, man, I like MCing and football. Mm -hmm. Like, okay. And then, like, I kept carrying on. And luckily, I had good people around me. I always say, see, like people say about where you start from foundation, but your surroundings are so important. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Surrounding, surrounding, support. Just know that. Don't understand. When I was young, I always got luckily, like I said, my older brother always used to tell me, you know what? If you get told no, it doesn't mean you're not good enough. It means that what well, that wasn't the right time for you. Mm -hmm. And before I didn't understand, I thought, when's the right time then? <laughs> <laughs> What's all these no's? Yeah. Okay, but see that like, ten no's, if you got one yes, it outweighs all of that. Mm -hmm. I had that mentality from young, from young, from young. And then people used to say, How did you get into these rays, man? Like, look how young. I said, I don't know. I don't know, like, even when I'm old enough On behalf of all the other 14-year-olds... <laughs> yeah. ..we could not believe we how couldn't. you were living. No, nah, yeah. it, was, it was just too... Um, Wiley, as you said, like, he brought me around, cos I'm rough squad, mm. and Roll Deep is from the same area as us, so they're like, you know what? 
I like Wiley just around me one day, like, um, Tinch, I said, hello, who is it? He said, it's Wiley, I thought, who? Yeah. Yeah. Wiley said, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, I like what you're doing. These like, times, he's a big man. He's a yeah. big man, I think, yeah. I know of him. I thought, I see him once in a while in the area. I love trainers, I'm like, bro, have you seen these clips? I'm like, I'm like bro, you got music, music, now let's do music. I'm like, my brother said, life's deeper than just trainers. <laughs> I said, but at my age, I like trainers. <laughs> and, then, yeah. and then when Wiley rang me, that day was like, wow, I can't forget. It's like, you know what, we got studio tomorrow. Come studio with me. I thought, yeah, I got, I got school. Yeah. <laughs> I got school. And after I thought, hold on, I can miss school one day. It's Wiley. I'm going to the studio. I thought, he's, he's talking, nah, don't do that, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and after I thought, you know what, I thought, you know what, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't like, I didn't like bunk school. I just didn't go. <laughs> yeah, that one. <laughs> I, didn't I wasn't. I wasn't feeling well that day. <laughs> then I went to the studio with him, and then that was so like magical. I thought, wow. And then I'm learning so much. Thinking, you know what? Like how people even write their lyrics, and you start thinking, okay, like how do you like? Did you just say it? Like shout to Sam. He's angry. He's mm -mm. Mm. but it's like nah, man. Self control. Pace yourself. Yeah. I said, no, but you like you've been doing this. I don't know what to do. I just give him the mic, and I don't know about studio. What do you do? Yeah. Mm. Okay. Just one take. I said, no, no, no. You can even like break it down bit by bit by bit. <clears throat> but when we was younger, we can only afford maybe an hour. Yeah, true. And we go halves for the money. Yeah. So you can't take five takes. Yeah, you can't. There's about get five of us. <laughs> one, bang, bang, bang. Yeah. And that's what made everyone on point. I'm thinking. Yeah. That's true. I remember that. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. Like, yeah, man. And that's what makes you like what you are. Because when you become like in a certain stage where I'm like, okay, we're well, a studio, and then when you go home, you listen to it. I'm like, yeah, that was people like. That was okay. I'm like, nah, that, that's, that's sick. And they're like, nah, you sound like you're rushing your words. Mm. I said, we didn't have time. Yeah. We didn't have time. Like, if I rush it, I'll take like five takes. Yeah. He gets one. That's not fair. So oh, it's... I want to I wanna progress your story on yeah. uh, a little because it's uh, um, you broke down a very big door. Yeah. So we're doing Grime, 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 Channel New Year's, Big Up Channel U. If we had more time, we'll talk about all of the media yeah. innovations. But just know that we've got a little space in the media. We're getting a little, well, that space is getting a little bit of funding. Um, and these two are on TV. Not, not many people are, though. Uh, mm. And there's not really, social media is not doing what it's doing, obviously, in this day and age. It weren't even a thing, innit? Just what? MSN. What? Right. Just got MSN. MSN. Uh, just oh MSN. Yeah, yeah, there was yeah. After that, was it MySpace? MySpace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, yeah. Facebook. Yeah. Facebook. There was, yeah. like, no YouTube. Yeah, there was no it was Twitter. hard to find out. There was no Facebook. Facebook. No fix, none of that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're, we're, we're still kind of relying on legacy media. Um, and in that space, yeah, we got one, BBC One Extra as well. Yeah. In that space, sure. um, Tinchy comes out with a song that states a new ambition. And the thing is, in, in grime, in rap in general, sometimes we just say stuff. Mm. You know, uh, we're dreaming big and um, not everyone follows through with, what, with, with their dreams. We're just young and expressing ourselves. But... Uh, can we please hear this song to just to get an idea of where Tinchy was at? Mainstream money. Wow. 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 That sounds like it's a fitting now. Wow. Yeah, for real, yeah. Yeah, that song, that sounds like it can fit. Wow. So for those who didn't catch it, the chorus is saying, this year I'm trying to get mainstream money. Mm -hmm. And as I said, we say a lot of things in rap, but a uh, funny thing happened with this one. <laughs> Tinchy went on to get mainstream <laughs> money. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. Most inconsistent. wow, yeah. So, so just to uh, elaborate a little bit, as you can hear in that track, it's uh, rapid, he, he's rapping yeah. really fast. Yeah. And that's just a standard of what we did. Um, Tinchy was very lyrical. Not all artists were lyrical, as he explained, you know, his um, rhymes used to be quite intricate and it took for people around him to say, all right, dumb it down, make it more yeah, accessible. Yeah. Um, and he moved to a new style. I think he's, you know, it seems like you started to consciously think about, all right, I can rap, everyone knows I can rap. Yeah. What else can I do? And I just want to run another tune which shows like the new, <laughs> the new tension <laughs> plays Stradaman. Did that one chart? Um, no, nah, but that's when I was independent. That's the first song of mine that got on Radio 1 playlist and a B-list. OK. But I thought, labels like, what? No mm. one does this. Like, mm. well, labels can't get an artist on Radio 1. Mm. You lot have done it independently. 
And I thought, yeah, but it's like, oh, I'm Strada, man. So, <laughs> yeah. You did the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know what? Before we carry on, you say, like, even with mainstream money, yeah. I said, this year I'm trying to get mainstream money and spending vapes and ice cream, ice cream money. money. When you get to the mainstream, ice vapes are not mainstream money. Yeah. That's what I was at for. Yeah. That's what yeah, yeah. yeah. that, that. Remember, that. he was saying he was obsessed with trainers, isn't trainers, it? Trainers, so yeah, yeah. Vapes for don't wow. know. That's, that's, that's still looking at. Um, that's assessing mainstream money by what you can buy. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Which um, that was is a whole other comment on rap and consumerism, but we'll get into that another time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so not long after that, yeah. eventually you got a number one. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then you got another number one. Oh, yeah. And then one more one, number one. one. Uh, no, I think I got two number ones and my album went number two. <laughs> All right, yeah, OK. Yeah. Before the first number one, I got a number three. Yeah. And then the next song was called number one. They're like, so where if this one goes to number two? <laughs> I said, I like making music. It's number one because about someone who's number one, not about where I'm going to chart. Right, right. And it went right. number one, then. Right, <laughs> right. I'm well, thankful, though. I'm thankful. Yeah. But that's, that's, a very, that's a very telling story. That's very poetic in itself. Um, uh, through, again, through the innovations of whatever we were making on our estate. Yeah. Independently, no label or an A&R nah. directing you here and there. You kind of in intuitive yeah, your man. way. Is that a word? Yeah. yeah. It is now. All right. Yeah. I'm not sure. You're the poet, right? Yeah. All right. Yeah, you're the poet. <laughs> he intuited his way um, to uh, mainstream positioning that was true to him. I loved the tune, and I didn't even like a lot of pop music at the time. Yeah, yeah. But you took pop music in another direction. Like, I always tell people you were like the first domino. After you went number one, I feel like Tiny went number one. N dubs. N dubs. Uh, Chip had. A massive... Did Uzi Days go number one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. think so. All right, so, yeah, our scene, all of a sudden, started to get mainstream attention. Mm -hmm. Now, that was pivotal in my life because um, we had been MCs from, I don't know, for about three or four years up to that point. And for those of you who know my story, I was in a grammar school, which was predominantly Asian. It had a very mainstream, middle-class culture and ideology, very different from the world that we come from. Mm -hmm. And when me and my friends used to rap, me and the few black boys in our year used to rap, we got called, you know, gang, we got called, you know, laughed at by the teachers, laughed at other people. Mm -hmm. Now, we have something that is actually mainstream facing. Mm -hmm. So it was pivotal. And the conversation around our music changes, which brings me nicely onto <laughs> Dr. Alima Gray. Mm -hmm. um, where I feel like me and Alima have a lot of overlap is, uh, first of all, Having to be someone in academic spaces where I feel like I'm carrying a whole deep story, a, 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 his, a history on my back that many people in the institutions that I'm working with don't necessarily understand. I have to represent this story um, and the methods that they use to tell stories and understand who my people are and understand who, who they are and how we relate to each other. We have different methods. You know, I left Cambridge and realised that rapping was one of our methods of figuring out who we were, etc. Mm. Um, and Alima, like, you and I have spoken yeah. quite a lot about you moving through the academy mm. and talking about um, Rastafari, your perspective, and often finding it an alienating experience because then people don't really know you. And you come back to your um, community and they don't really understand what you're doing out there in that world. But the music, at the end of the day, will centre you and give a certain clarity and a fundamental truth to your mm -hmm. line of inquiry. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, from your, your perspective, from com coming um, from Portland, Jamaica, <laughs> over here, <laughs> right, as a, a, a young girl about eight years old, mm -hmm. and then moving through to become, like, a leading academic in, in, in your field, in uh, history, um, can you just speak to us about navigating that cultural world and the, the challenges of storytelling in that space? Yeah, I mean, where do I begin? It's, it's a difficult one because obviously within Farai, history, I always say is this doing is a verb, is an action, it's not. I feel like the way in which history is understood today and particularly in like school is like boring, like, what are you studying that? What are you gonna do with history? You know, these are all of the questions, but from my experience, like understanding the community histories, like everywhere is history is a living thing. So in Jamaica, you have a lot of like oral history culture. I'm sure it's the same in, you know, the African continent as well, where like things are being carried down and passed down through just the stories and the storytelling. Mm. So my understanding of history was just being in 
reasoning sessions, listening to the uncles and the aunties talking and being like, right, and, he and hearing the music, mm. you know, listening to, you know, reggae music is definitely the entry point for me. And, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of the kind of conscious singers in Jamaica is definitely an entry point for me. But, yeah, it's understanding that, I guess, music has always been this, went hand in hand with this education. Facts. It's been this kind of educative force. <laughs> Whether or not you see it as that. So even when I think about... I was listening. I was re-listening to your album this morning, oh, and there's I, and it was reminding me of when I was listening to your album back in the day. Yeah. And there's like a young girl that's like, when you try, like oh, she's my little goddaughter. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. She's done the intro. So the yeah, album. that's what I'm saying. So that's very powerful. So it's kind of teaching you these education. So I was speaking to you about Christopher Columbus, you know, Burning Spear, and um, Christopher Columbus was a damn liar, and Bujabant, and so these are the messages that I had and, and I carried with me, and for me, mm. without the music, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really have been able to navigate all of these structures, so mm. even, you know, coming forward to, like, be on the baseline and curate and be on the baseline, the thing that I was trying to think about is how do we curate something that helps as opposed to hurt? Because mm -hmm. there's just so much unhelpful information, True. particularly about black people culture, black British culture, African and Caribbean heritage. And so it's like, how can we foreground something that's like helpful mm. and that people can feel like mm. it's an emotional, it's emotional knowledge. So, mm -hmm. you know, when we, look, when we went to the cyberspace section and as, these, uh, as they're talking, I'm like, it's a real thing because it's like in the cyberspace section, one of the things that we say is, you know, we're dreaming dreams to our laptops and mobile phones. And like, that's just the reality. But what society sees is something else. Yeah. But we're seeing so, like inside, yeah. we know that it's something else, you know? So it's like trying way. to bridge that gap. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, it was so surreal. When you guys uh, get to the exhi exhibition, you're going to see the cyber, what do you call it? Cyberspace, cyberspace yeah. section. <laughs> And in the display, there's things like a PS2 game. Was it a PS2 or yeah, PS1? Yeah. PS2, probably um, a Walkman and... Um, oh, my goodness. Your album's wow. there, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With the Walkman. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but, um, and, yeah, weirdly, I said to Alima, I'm getting emotional. <laughs> I must be getting old, because <laughs> it really made... It, it gave me goosebumps to think that, yeah, as you said, the way this thing... These items, the way they, will, uh, they, the way they might appear or be commented on in the media is one way. But to me, they're like... Um, yeah, they're everything. They're, they're mm -hmm. a True. gateway to a time mm -hmm. and yeah. to an experience. It's true. Speaking mm -hmm. of which, would... Do you have a, a, a tune that we can run that, that situates us in your setting? Can we go to your... Yeah. Yeah? yeah, yeah Let, let's hear from uh, Buja Banton, Untold Stories. Oi. <laughs> and you know... It's making me emotional just uh -huh. even listening to it. You know? It's like that. It's yeah. like that. Um, when, uh, when I was just listening to that just now, something that I don't know if I wrote about it in my book, but something that I always think when I hear Buju. Like, Buju Banton was a, a seminal artist in his generation. I feel like he came around, out around late 80s, early 90s, mm -hmm. and he um, had, a, had a new approach or a new style, and he was so versatile. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes he'd be straight rapping, sometimes he'd be singing, sometimes he'd be spiritual, sometimes he'd be street, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes he'd be for the girls, sometimes he'd be Ciao. having jokes, <laughs> right? Um, but he influenced a whole generation of... Ugandan artist, I didn't tell you this. Oh, wow. um, a lot of uh, Ugandan pop music, in fact, Ugandan pop music right now, as a standard, is based on Jamaican dance world. And uh, um, some of you guys will have heard of Bobby Wine, uh, mm -hmm. right? The main opposition um, in, uh, to the government in, um, in Uganda. He's, he's an opposition politician now, but he came up as a, uh, an artist. And his singing style, was the Ugandan version of Buju really? <laughs> you know? So yeah, there are all of these linkages mm. across diaspora mm. that are, are visible, that are clear when you listen to this music. Mm. So um, just tell us what it's been like for you telling that story in non-black spaces. Like, oh. That like? <laughs> yeah, I tell you about that ass. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been, I think one of the things that, you know, I, I, maybe it's different when you're a musician, but definitely when I'm doing this kind of work, I, I think about the audience. 
I think about who is it I'm in conversation with? Who do I want to be in conversation with? And I know for a lot of musicians, they're just creating and, mm. you know, they're feeling the vibes and creating or based upon what they're seeing. But definitely when you curate, and particularly within the space of the British Library, you know, although we have access to, you know, we hold one of the largest sound and vision collections in the world, but for a lot of people who look like me, we don't access these places, right? <laughs> so I'm like, for me to kind of create and co-curate with Dr. Michael Riley, who's mm -hmm. sitting here, can't forget, who kind of came up with the vision around 500 years of black British music, the starting point for me was definitely thinking about the audience and making sure that the library understands that the audience is African and Caribbean heritage community predominantly, mm, okay. is music fans and is young people. Thank you. And so as I'm visioning that audience, I'm kind of like, what is the story that I want to tell them? And not only what do we want them to know, but how do we want them to feel? Yeah. Mm. You know what I mean? So when they enter the space, it's not just about, you know, some people engage with the sound, some people want to read. I'm surprised there's quite a lot of people that's actually read. Um, yeah. But it's also about the feeling and the energy because that music is embodied, it's felt. So when you're looking at the objects, I want them to feel the different emotional journeys that we take. So mm. we start in the ocean where we're looking at you know, the early histories around African presence in Britain. Mm -hmm. And we kind of take that right the way up to, to you both, you know, <laughs> all, of you, all of you guys. And it's, it's really a journey, but one of the things that, you know, we're kind of foregrounding and beyond the baseline is music as this conversation. Mm -hmm. It's a conversation that provokes, disrupts, connects, excites, but it's a conversation that lives within all of us and is kind of, there's a history, there's a present and there's a future to it, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, the music is alive and our history is alive when we're able to capture it in the music. Right. Uh, one of the reasons why um, this is so important to me and why I'm so passionate about, as much as I'm advancing a political argument in a lot of my work, I always uh, keep music at the centre of it, is because through music you can uh, live our history, not just learn it, not just remember it, but live it. Mm. You know, when we listen to Mainstream Money, when we listen to One Wish, um, we're transported to an era. Mm. And you remember all of the things that you knew yeah. and didn't know. Mm. Yeah. Like, I didn't know I was going to be here. I didn't know yeah. I was going to actually make Mainstream Money. Yeah. And it was yeah. going to be more than babes and ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I really thank you guys for giving us uh, space to really uh, talk about this. And I'd love if... Uh, we could move to a Q&A section where we can get a bit of a dialogue started. Um, unless you guys had anything else that you wanted to get off your chest. <laughs> no? We good? All right, okay. Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking. No, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good, I'm good. Also, we've got shouts out to our online audience. Um, welcome any questions from online as well. Yeah, yeah, you, you don't always do this. So it's like, oh, oh I don't want to say nothing at first, and then we're going to be running out of time. All right, OK, there we go, there we go. Wow. Oh, Mike. OK, crazy. <laughs> Hi. Um, hello. Thank you for all being the incredible artists that you are. Um, it's so mad to me that in your time of coming up, like, no YouTube, no social media in those days, like, how are you spreading your word around how are you doing that like it's so mad it's so mad that my mind can't fathom <laughs> life without like youtube for a hot second so yeah please just more on that because you guys must have been hungry back yeah. in the yeah. days to be doing that me me personally like mm -hmm. probably you really as well Shay. it's like we just knew as in basically let's say gram mc and it's like just going to i guess pirate radio stations doing raves and just hopefully spreading. Like I said, we didn't know the bigger world like that. T, could you explain yeah. what a pirate radio station is? OK, pirate radio station, basically, it's a radio station that's kind unregistered. of... Unregistered. Unregistered, <laughs> to put it nicely. It's not legal. It's not legal. Yeah. And you go there, like, say there's, like, like a rig thing there, and then sometimes you've got to help the owner put it up. Yeah. <laughs> when, you, when you go there, it's like, OK... She's just like, what? <laughs> She not was doing that. And you don't know, you don't know how, how far it goes out, don't know who's hearing it or not, you know what I mean? But you're like, are oh, you on pirate radio? You know, that's actually so sick because when we used to do it and we yeah. used to, like, listen to... So, I grew up in Hackney, yeah. in East London, and then I moved to North London. So, in North London, we had a pirate radio station called Heat. 
Oh, yeah. Heat FM. Sorry, I'm glad yeah. you said that. Yeah. Remind me, you said Heat FM. I got a story. And so we'd be like <laughs> on the dial, like trying to type, um, dial it in. And then if you could dial it in properly, you could hear like the South London station. I think, yeah. is it, um, is it um, Dubai or something? I can't remember. It might have been. Yeah, and then you could, you, it was like, like the war times, like just tuning <laughs> <laughs> it. Like, trying to hear what they're rapping yeah. about and yeah. stuff like that. But it was so, like, sorry, yeah. Sorry, sis, these are like, Analog radios. Yeah. Analog. <laughs> <laughs> just wow. It when was, you think of it, that's really, what we're really from. No, seriously. No, yeah. yeah. No. yeah it's just, just trying to catch a wave in the air. Yeah, you have to literally turn the thing. And like. then, yeah, and then you're hoping someone yeah. taped you, someone recorded yeah, yeah, and yeah, taped yeah. you. But like I said, I'm back to Heat FM. Yeah. One of the, like I said, I'm from Bow, East London, and travelling to, it was like North London, that's yeah. where it was. I ain't trying to say exactly where it was, but it was in North London. <laughs> and then, we go there, make our way there. One time I was like, MC and the owner had like a dog there. Yeah, Chris like, J. Chris J. Yeah. He had his dog there that looked after the place. And then I was just there ready to start going on the mic. And then this was a staff. And mm. the staff must have just attacked me. <laughs> <laughs> it just bit my, I think everyone at home can hear me. That shout, I'm thinking, whoa, I just got a <laughs> I just want to MC. Yeah. I thought, I thought well, I've seen this dog before though. What happened today? <laughs> and then they attacked me. And then everyone I'm always, oh, back in. And then the owner had to come. When's got the lock jaw on you or whatever? Yeah. The owner, I thought, whoa, I'm just this screaming. This is what we had to deal I had to with. deal with this. And then after that, that somehow he's got the dog off me. And then I went back on the mic. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I must love him seeing. Yeah. And then I've got when I got I've got I've got home. I went home now after I, I told my mum I got there's a stray dog in bow attacked me. I can't say I went pirate. She's what was yeah. that? <laughs> so I went to the hospital, got checked whether I thought this dog and after I thought, rah, and then everyone's saying, bro, I thinking, what are you lot doing? I thought the dog was attacking, what should we do? <laughs> <laughs> I went home, so I'll never forget that story, man. I thought I just knew that. I love them seeing. That's passion. That showed me that. <laughs> so, that, like you said, there was no like, oh, YouTube, nothing for Pirate Radio, we need this. That's all we had. Yeah, that's all we had. We just had like Pirate Radio and youth Channel clubs. U Channel and U. Youth Clubs. As Even well. Channel U, I guess like you had to pay to get on there. I didn't. That's what I'm saying. Oh. <laughs> Some people didn't pay, but yeah. say like, say like, how much, how much they charge for a video? Say we've got a video, there's five of us on a song. Yeah. We're all going, like, splitting Part money. splitting money. And then yeah. that don't mean they're going to take it or play it. Yeah. Like, but add, that's all we had. That's I want to add had. one more element as well. Yeah. We had Bluetooth on our phones. Oh, oh the Nokia's God. as well. You understand? So yeah. remember... Infrared. Yeah, yeah. Infrared. 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 You've got to hold Infrared. it. Infrared. Infrared. That's when you got to hold your phone like this. Hold it. Phone. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Star Wars. <laughs> wow. So, wow. No, remember... No, we went through it. Yeah, the struggle, and I, struggle. I'd be... I'd be Making jokes about my mum and dad's age, like this is how my niece is, and probably think. my niece, she she saw my album and she was just like, it was on the disc. She's like, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> She's like, how do you play this? What do you have to do? Where does it Crazy. go? I was like, yeah. put it down. It's <laughs> <laughs> true, isn't it? Because CD yeah. cars know it in her life. Laptops yeah. don't, don't take CDs she, no more. Like, they don't. She, they don't take CDs they no don't. more. They don't so remember, it. there's always a, a like a network out there that's hungry for it anyway. Yeah. You know, so if if they hold up the rig and they're able to put out their um, radio Signal. show, yeah. we're going to catch it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dying for it. Somehow, yeah. 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 But thanks for that question. Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> OK, so this is a question for George. Um, so basically, when you're inspired or uninspired um, when you're writing poetry, have you ever stolen lines from other poets? <laughs> <laughs> I do. Why do I feel like that's a loaded question? Yeah. <laughs> about stolen lines. Um, obviously, no, but have I taken inspiration, inspiration from... Sometimes I hear someone say something, I think, I wish I thought of that, or they've captured something so beautifully, I want to carry that thought. <clears throat> Interestingly, the thing that I, I, that I would borrow from the most is um, R&B music. Mm -hmm. um, especially R&B music written by people like the singer Her mm. and um, Summer Walker. Mm. Wow. Because they just capture scenarios quite well. Um, Ari Lennox as well. Yeah. The way they capture very specific scenarios makes me feel like um, I, want, I want to respond or I want to capture a scenario that, that well. So, mm. yeah, that's what I do. Cool. <clears throat> Can we get a question on this side? Uh, 
Um, good evening. This question is directed to Dr. Gray. Um, thank you for organising this exhibition. Um, when I was going around the exhibition with a friend of mine just a couple of hours ago, it was really lovely to see the dates, the early dates of the presence of people of African descent in the UK and the contribution they've made to um, the music scene. Um, my thoughts were it would be nice for young people, young like teenagers and what have you, to be able to access these spaces. The problem there, however, is in terms of cost and accessibility. Mm. So being that you're in the position that you are, my concern would be how would we get more young people to see these, be in the, become access these spaces and feel part of the mainstream, so to speak, mm -hmm. I'm referring back to. That's my main concern anyway. Okay, thank you. Um, it's a concern that um, we had many conversations with as a program was developing. Um, the library has, I always like to say that, you know, I'm, the way how I kind of work is very much like a circle and sometimes institutions can be a square. And not a lot of people, unless you work on an exhibition, appreciates just how much isms and schisms and processes that you have to go through to approve every little thing. Um, it's insane. But one of those things was talking about access, and we've been having a lot of conversations about access as a verb, not just as a thing that's like a tick box. So this show is different from library shows in that there is a cheaper ticketing cost, but there's also like pay what you can days, which is the first of every month. So tomorrow yeah. is, is pay what you can. Um, there's also like, uh, if you're under a certain age, under 14s are free. Um, so there's like different kind of price tags that we had to work collectively and collaboratively, you know, because obviously heritage institutions needs to fund themselves as well. Um, and I'm hoping that beyond the baseline, the ways in which we've approached ticketing has offered a way for people, you know, if you, if you haven't got any money, just come on the first of every month. Mm -hmm. um, but we do, you know, school visits and stuff like that through like formal learning. So, but it isn't, it's, it's never really enough, but I, I see this as more of a kind of starting point to get people engaged. And I think what's really good with Beyond the Baseline is that it's very much a collaborative effort. So there's been so many different artists, activists, community leaders, musicians, that's kind of collaborated with us. So everybody who's lended us an object and worked with us in those commission spaces, they have free access into the space and can bring their friends and family. And through that, it's been a really good way to um, encourage more people to come and see this place. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, but you know, it's, a, it's never enough, so we just got to continue to do better, really. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Um, can we get one from this side? I see, I see a hand up top over there. Over here. Um, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I'm 19. I actually used um, the lyrics of Cat D when I was trying to run for um, school counselor. <laughs> and I reworded them to like kind of make it make sense for Oakdale, which is my school. And it made sense because I was with young people and they kind of got where I was coming from. But I feel like as I've grown older, being in new spaces and trying to reference things from like childhood or from culture and having to explain things a lot, like you guys were explaining what a reload was for people that didn't get it. <laughs> How do you handle constantly having to like explain things when people just don't understand mm -hmm. cultural things. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. Thank you for that question. I would say for my part, I consciously stepped into a role of explainer. Maybe not consciously. Remember, I went to a school where I was a minority, like the smallest minority. Um, so I ended up having to translate a lot. And now that I'm thinking about it, that was uncomfortable at first especially I was dealing with um, young boys, you know, like a lot of insensitive, inappropriate jobs being made all the time um, in quite a racially charged atmosphere. Mm. Uh, and I think that maybe early on made me a little bit resilient and made me determined to set the record straight. As I was saying, when Tinchy went mainstream, I felt vindicated 
I felt like, yeah, we, we, we weren't just bluffing. We, we were working hard at something and um, people are recognizing. And now when I look at your generation, um, I feel like black British culture is, it is mainstream. It is almost the standard of youth culture. Yeah. And um, uh, again, that's a, a lot of work went into that. Me and Shiesty were joking earlier about how um, as MCs, we went long stretches of time broke, mm -hmm. yeah. not making any money out of this yeah. thing. Um, but you've heard all of the things that people branched into. So because the culture has spread, I and because the culture comes from such a specific experience, mm -hmm. I have felt it incumbent on me being in different worlds to explain what I can and translate what I can. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, for those who didn't necessarily sign up to that, it, it gets exhausting. And I don't know if uh, anyone else wants to say something about that. <laughs> I, I kind of, it's not really much to add to that, but like you're saying, with the, especially like with the reloads thing, I was in a place where, like you're saying, when we was in it, we, it felt like it was the norm. Cause I was learning, what's a reload? And then people said, nah, it's reload, and it's like calling it forward. Mm. And so reload and forward is <laughs> two opposite things, mm. but it meant the same thing. Mm. I realised that it comes from a culture, I guess, from, like, mm. Jamaica's and that mm. forward. Yeah. They see watching a lot of things and then pull I understand up. that, yeah, pull up, forward, <laughs> reload, rewind, so many things. Mm -hmm. and So I understood where, like, you learn something new every day, but the best thing about it is having conversation with people about it because I'm always thinking, even when I'm explaining to someone, I'm learning myself as well. Mm. And that's where level we got to it for, you know what? Even like you're saying, when they got to the mainstream, they don't know what reload means in that. They're just like, oh, what? that song's catchy, man. They, they just yeah. know the hook, they want to sing along mm. to that. Yeah. But for us, you're like, you want a song to get stopped and rewinded, yeah. but <laughs> when you go to certain shows, you can't reload it. Yeah. So it's like, it depends where you're at, but I guess every situation, every step you're at, different challenge, different questions, and you just have to learn how to have the right answer at the right time. Yeah. Very true. Thank you for that question. Um, yeah. I'll leave it to you guys. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I feel like I got an exclusive episode of George's podcast and yeah. it was, it was, felt good. <laughs> I think that um, I wanted to ask a question that just around what I've been already thinking about and trying to link it to music. So, like, I saw a video of um, like a protest in Sudan where there was violins and trumpets and like, all different instruments on the front lines of the protest. And I'm studying at a, a university where there's drums, they're encamping at the protest, and there's drums there. And I wanted to ask you, lot, what do, is there a song that says protest or revolution to you? Like, what, what is a song that comes to your mind? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Wow. Alima's going first. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> Oof. <laughs> you can't do that to me. There's so many. There's I so mean, many. there's so many. Definitely hard. Burning Spear, Christopher Columbus, Christopher you know? Columbus. Yeah, um, it's hard. Yeah. Um, I would say, I don't want to, there's just so many. All right, so I'll, I'll take one. Zimbabwe by Bob Marley. Oh, that's a big one. <laughs> that's, that's my go-to um, <laughs> Uh, revolutionary. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's um, also it's a, a lot of Tupac, you know. Yeah. When I was young, yeah. I kind of yeah. took Tupac for granted because he was positioned as a gangster rapper. Mm. But uh, the older I get and the more I understand how he was trying to filter Black Panther philosophy, translate it into a hip-hop gangster rap context, mm. the more I'm just... I, I was listening to Changes earlier. Changes is... Changes is sick. If you really, yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's different. We get desensitized because we hear it so much. But if you really understand that he's calling, he's calling for socialistic transformation. You know, mm. like it's it's a lot. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Anyone else wanna? I can't think off the top of my head. Uh, yeah, no, I'm I can't. I think I think like the like you said, like the two pack, but Mali, a lot of their things mm. felt that way. Yeah. Yeah. Still pulse, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. still pulse, still pulse, still, still pulse. Still pulse. <laughs> but it's also like. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they were. Everyone's got their own yeah. one. Yeah. Mm. Uh, like Loki's whole catalogue. Yeah, you know, Loki. yeah Loki. All yeah, of, of Loki's uh, Palestine songs. Mm. Free Palestine. So um, mm -hmm. yeah. make sure Shut it gets said. <clears throat> Thank 
Free Sudan, yeah. Congo. Congo, Free Congo. Haiti. Congo. Um, I was listening to some Sudanese rap from the front lines. Uh, if you tweet me, because uh, I never remember the, the name, but there's, a, there's someone that goes around to conflict zones and records rap <laughs> rappers just spitting. Like, it's wow. crazy. Um, so yeah, it, at me or something and I'll, I'll send you the link to that. Let's, uh, let's get these questions in. Can we get some from this side? Thank you. We're gonna need to start getting some at the back as well. Sorry, I know we've been neglecting you guys. <laughs> Good evening. Um, <clears throat> I just wanna say a quick thank you and uh, a little precursor to how I ask questions because sometimes it's a bit, I, I give a little context to the question and I'll leave it right at the end. Um, so first of all, George, I want to say thank you so much. I see you like a, a, a modern griot um, with what you've done with Ben Brick and the podcast and how you're utilising music. Just to let you know that we see you every single day. I've listened to episodes over and over again. I'm going to make reference to one of the episodes as well mm -hmm. in this question. Um, Tinchi, man, <laughs> that's, I had one star in the hood hoodie. <laughs> and I wore it until the print faded off. So I have to thank you for that. And it's amazing to see Rough Squad, Danger, Rapid and Slicks coming back. And um, I wonder if we're going to see you, but mm. it would be nice, but, you know. Um, <laughs> and Shaisti, I want to thank you for adding that gender balance into what was a very masculine sound. Thank you. And it was really Bless important. You. Thank you. And Dr... <laughs> Dr. Elima, I just want to have to say thank you for this platform. Um, I see Beyond the Baseline as a um, geography, technology, and distribution. And, and that's one of the things, that's the heavy thoughts in my mind of what we do with music nowadays. Yeah. Um, how we talk about pirate radio, um, because pirate radio was about using technology and it was because of our geography and making that distribution yeah. and the effects that what that does for people who are in, whether it's from south to north or or all around all around the city. <coughs> and the technology that we learn from doing that, I used to learn how to get radio signal from a hangar. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's that's physics, that's physics. Definitely. You know, Definitely. and that's because of people like, like that. Tinchi, that's because of people like, um, like all of you, MT Shy, it's because I want to hear people like you. So I, I had to understand this stuff and how we're talking about infrared. That's, that's science, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, George, you have an episode, Songs Make Jobs. And you talk about how we can utilize music beyond being the artist and, and what that has. So my question is really about, to, to quote like an academic, CLR James talks about speculation. And I'm thinking about how we can listen deeper to, to draw out more of a substance from music, you know, so we can get like a, almost our own sonic vocabulary, you know, like how DJs interact with music now, they're, they're making songs talk to each other, or how you, how even the technology of sampling is, is a, it, it's educational, you know? So I wanted to know if you guys have any ideas on how we can use music as a methodology to, to, to be more critical in our own lives. Uh, with double eight dramas, should I see you put music to scenario mm. so we could see that, you know, that's one way, but I'm thinking nowadays, I f it feels like these lyrics need to do more. And I'm not saying every artist needs to be super conscious or whatever, but I want to say like, that, like, you know, when you reference a bar and that bar just helps you, like, mm. this bar helped me in a job interview. And it, this, this is meaning condensed down into sometimes vibrations, sometimes into words. Mm. So I just want to know what we can do with it other than just dancing and, mm. you know, yes. and flexing, you know? Thank you. <laughs> so thank you so much for that question. That's a good question. One of my PhD supervisors is in the building, Dr. Mariana Matsukato. She's at the back. Hey. And um, she must have been smiling while you were talking because you're just preempting my whole doctorate. <laughs> <laughs> like, so much of what you said. Like, uh, the, the original question that led me to do a PhD was basically to what extent can black music provide a, uh, a platform or facilitate black liberation? First of all, I was thinking jobs wise, that's why I made that podcast episode, Songs Make Jobs. 
I was thinking around every shiesty, around every tinchy, there's a team, and that team needs to be versatile. They need to be professional, and they need a, a, a legal understanding. They need a, a, a business understanding. So I started from there, but then the more I looked at um, the, the nature of capitalism and, and the nature of black people within capitalism, the more I, I, I stripped it back a bit, and I was like, there's, there's, a, there's a bit more to look at fundamentally. But you're, you're bringing me back to the core of my inquiry. Um, our music already does a lot in our life. Mm. Uh, Alima's talked about it being a living history. You know, our, our history is being alive via music. That's, if you listen to my podcast, you know that that's the key obsession. Mm. The history is alive in the music. And that's one thing, but I've also tried through my podcast to show how the music is a form of pedagogy. It's a teaching method. It's a learning method. Um, now, the reason, as I was saying, with, with regards to my doctorate, that I've pivoted slightly away from looking at just jobs and I'm now looking a bit more broadly about our relation to cap capitalism is the answer to your, to your question about how can it do more than just make us dance, a lot of it has to do with uh, our, our relation to our economic system. So if we're in a system that prioritises profit, and um, the, the nature of um, the industry, the music industry right now, is to make profit in a particular way. Mm -hmm. If you get a chance to read my book, you're going to see my struggle trying to convince them to just make profit promoting social messages. Mm -hmm. And you realise there's a, there's a political character to these industries. There are things that the controllers of these industries are comfortable with and things that make them uncomfortable you realise that it's not just about jobs, it's not just about profit, it's also about um, uh, fighting for contested space in, in media. Like, uh, media is a very powerful industry. Mm -hmm. So if you got all of these young people saying to the sister earlier that black culture is basically, you know, the dominant force in youth culture, if you've got a whole generation suddenly thinking about history, thinking about how they present themselves, thinking about how they show up in the media spaces, thinking about um, uh, the influence that big corporations have on their stories and their messages and their geographies and their bodies. Mm -hmm. If you get people thinking about this consciously, it's going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. So we need to fix our mind to creating that problem. Mm -hmm. uh, the sister just in front of you earlier was asking about how we can get more young people in spaces like this. And I was thinking to myself, I didn't want to jump in, but I was thinking, it's a political question as well. You know, if we talked, uh, Stride was talking about how there were youth clubs that allowed us to incubate grime. Mm. Those youth, cl youth clubs ain't around anymore. Not there anymore. Mm. I did an interview on, my, on the estate that I grew up on the other day, and I, I meant to walk through an area where there, were where there was a park that had been there throughout my whole childhood, because I wanted the sound of kids playing and laughing, the space was empty. Mm. Let me explain. The, the houses were still there. The trees were still there. The park had been taken away. Mm. There's, a, there's a political character to these decisions, and it influences our geographies. It influences how we tell our, his, tell our story, and therefore it influences not just the content of our music, but what that music does. However, going back to the answer that we gave to the sister earlier in terms of how did we share music before social media, there's always people. Mm. And that is where the solution lies. Boy better knows Ben had it. But wait, sorry, we need questions at the back. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, hello? Um, how are the algorithms shaping the black British music? Thank you, thank you. Um, I'm gonna, unless someone wants to jump in first. I ain't got an answer. <laughs> 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 um, from, from what I understand, mm. um, algorithms are shaping popular music uh, in general in a number of ways. The, the, the main game changer, I would say, has been maybe TikTok and the music industry's pivot towards TikTokable hits. So instead of 
doing the legwork that Shasti and uh, Tinchi just talked about. Instead of developing an artist, developing an artistic scene, we can get a quick win if a song goes viral. Mm. And if the algorithms are inclined towards virality, and if you, you know, TikTok will recommend, if, if you're making a video, TikTok will say, do you want to use, um, you know, this song? Yeah and your video is gonna be preferred over other videos mm. if you use a song that TikTok's recommended, mm. now all of a sudden everyone's trying to sound like TikTok, TikTok yeah. right? Um, so that's one way in which the algorithm influences things, but also going back to the political character of a lot of the media organizations that push black music, mm. um, if you've got a, a, a moment or a generation or a wave of really, of music that has a particular slant, a particular um, character, and you want to be creative outside of that, this is what I found in my um, career. The algorithms that favour the bulk of music are going to overlook you. Mm. So now you've got to find hacks, you've got to find ways around it, which is one of the reasons that I ended up making a podcast mm. instead of continuing to try and make songs in a climate where, <coughs> because I don't sound like everything else, I'm going to be overlooked, yep. then the conversation is True. going to be that I fell off or yep. I, I wasn't able to survive in this context mm -hmm. where, really, I was just resisting going along with the crowd mm -hmm. and the algorithm was making it quite difficult. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in the same way that Shiesty did a TV show, uh, mm -hmm. Strides was able to do his clothing and all sorts, mm -hmm. we have to diversify, we have to pivot. But, yeah, thank you for the question about the algorithm. I think, I think as well, just, like... I guess it also chimes in with some of your questions where you're talking about deep listening. I think there's also an educative aspect of it, which is a lot of the work that, you know, Michael with the Black Music Research Unit is kind of leading on in terms of when you tap... So, for instance, an example of that is when you Google Black British soul singer, mm. Amy Winehouse comes up. Oh. Yeah. Wow. So there's an issue in terms of how this right here is being understood within research and within yeah. the academy that you know we're trying to navigate. There's not really a lot of people that's publishing work, that's understanding, you know, mm. um, black music, <coughs> black British music. And so what that means is that this, this, this technology is actually controlling. T is controlling and and reinforcing things that are not true. Mm. So there's also an element of those of us who are in university and can manage university to publish more, to kind of counterbalance mm. those damaging narratives that's yeah. being put forward. True, thank you. All right, let's, let's, let's go for one more question. Somewhere at the back, somewhere. <laughs> one where? Yeah. <laughs> she, she wants it. <laughs> All right. Might do more than one question. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, I just wanted to see if you could provide some insight into this new wave of like drill music and this kind of glorification of sometimes quite violent music um, in mainstream media and the effect that that can have on the youth and wider society. The, sh the, sh the short answer is grab my book when you get a chance. I, I, I talk about this quite a bit. Um, but yeah, I, there, there, was a, there was a turn, all right? There was a turn in the, at the late, 80s, early 90s, where this new form, this rap thing that we were coming up with, it went from something diverse. There was feminist rap, con uh, conscious rap, Afro-conscious rap, all sorts, to just gangster. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, it became gangster. And this coincided with the entry of the major labels into our uh, scene. They bought up a lot of um, uh, labels, or boutique labels that used to make hip-hop music. The music became less diverse. It became a lot more violent. NWA um, saw huge success, and from there, it was kind of decided that the standard was going to be um, that the black man in music, in his highest, most commercially, commercially appealing form, was going to be a gangster. So that's, that's the element of this problem that is top-down, in my opinion. Labels made a decision that this is what the, the model of black masculinity that we're going to double down on. Going back to Alima's point about how other people define uh, what is real mm. and what is, you know, authentic. And, and uh, we have to struggle through these external de uh, um, definitions. How it translates to the modern day is that increasingly the standard has become um, 
to be a rapper. Again, I talk about this dilemma while I was growing up, and it would be interesting to hear it from Tinchy's perspective. To be a rapper, you've got to be um, performing black masculinity in the way that American gangster rap makes normal. Interestingly, I saw the parallel happen with Jamaican dancehall. It would be amazing to hear uh, Alima's perspective on it, but again, I talk about it quite a lot in my podcast. Um, but it's a complex interplay between young people trying to speak to or trying to emulate the media that they consume, mm. um, trying to navigate an increasingly uh, dangerous environment that uh, is, uh, has all of the social supports and the community-centering practices stripped away from them over and over again, mm. and the situation just being left to fester. Mm. Yeah. And the only response being um, a repressive one, uh, <coughs> one of force, not one of nurturing um, <clears throat> and you know, real community work. So it's a multi-layered problem that is compounded by uh, the incentives of the music industry to continue investing in harmful images that black people don't get to dictate for themselves more time. Mm -hmm. Interesting. BBK. <laughs> My question's a little bit loaded. So um, I'm 15. And 15? Yeah. Sorry. Is that beard? This guy, <laughs> beard. I could Son never grow a beard like that. What? Hold I need on. to see Wait, your sorry, passport. Sorry. <laughs> what is going on? Wait, the T-shirt's older than him. Yes. The T-shirt is older than him. Wow. He's got a beard in it. <laughs> You're less than half my age. That's oh, right. my God. Anyway. Um, so, <laughs> when I go to school, like, I get a little bit... So, so, is that your year 10? 11. <laughs> oh, you're going to do UCSEs? I should be revising right now. <laughs> 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 okay, okay, okay. Oh. Um, it's like, yeah, when I go to school, I get a little bit clowned for listening to grime music. Because yeah. everyone's listening to like drill or like, uh, like UK rappers or like you know like Travis Scotts, all of them. Um, and then, uh, even though a lot of stuff today comes from grime culture, um, and we have people like you know Renz, Mez, Oblig, carrying it on, um, but they're very like, it's a small community now, mm. rather than the massive impact it had before. So and then obviously you've got like Nizim Jar, like Shiesty modelled for him. And we've got a star in the hood, like cassette player, Carrie Munden. Without them, we wouldn't have like Cortez's, Trap Stars, yep. all of these. Yeah. So how do you see grime as a culture itself moving on rather than dispersing into all these different spaces? Mm. He's not 15. Yeah. That's not a 15 year wow. old. It's given CIA. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, that is hilarious. You don't have to answer that. Yeah. I ID check. Yeah. <laughs> ID check. <laughs> now, now, um, now, you know what, though? That's a really good question, you know, like, what you're saying is, like, I don't know, I think it's a thing where everyone from Graham, the original Graham artist, it's like, we never look at it that way, but as you're saying, Graham's always, that people say, oh, Graham's coming back alive. But I'm like, when did it die? Mm -hmm. mm. When did it die? Oh, Graham's alive, and I'm like, that's the issue because people were talking about. Graham, what it actually is, yeah, naturally stuff from, like, Pirate Radio comes, I'm saying, doing, like, I guess, like, Raves and that. That's not what it is right now. And people want that. It's mm. like I said, I know that um, fashion clothes, like Cortez, everyone, beat them up and they will tell you where they started from. Do you know what I mean? Even like, for example, like Star in the Hood, there's what's the new, what's the thing? Hoodrich. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> people tell me that comes from that. I don't mind because that's what they did, that's what they did. Even the font looks the same. Even the yeah. font looks the same, but I don't know who they I ain't spoken to them, but it's that. You need to get some money from it. <laughs> It's a lot of big convos to have, but I'm like, you know what? I don't ever like one thing that I've always grown up. I don't like stopping anyone's things. Like, yeah. if it's helping you help your family and yourself, God bless you. But just don't forget where it originated from. And what we have to do as grandma artists and wherever everyone around it, keep reminding them and just by like, doing that like, new, keep growing. Because if you keep focusing on, oh, but why do they think? Why do they? You're thinking why? They're like, cool, keep staying there. We're moving on. So you have to yeah. catch up with what's going on and just keep advancing, man. Don't ever feel like. It's always a new day, it's always a new page. Mm. So what you have to do is just understand that some people, for example, you're 15. <coughs> you're 15, right? When, <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when I started, when I was like 14 or something, I don't want to tell how old I am now, but yeah. you're 15. Yeah. 
It's like a thing where like it's so it's so it's good to us that even you know of this. You're wearing a boy Ben O T shirt. Say for example, Jamie, Skippy's brother, yeah, like he designed that um Jamie done my first mixtape cover for me. You know what I mean? Yeah, he done the first Say again? Didn't you release it on the Boy Better No? No, I had had Boy Better on it because JME designed it. So he, like, he was smart already, put yeah. Boy Better on it. <laughs> but, <laughs> so many things you're learning and just growing and growth. And I'm like, it's hard to even answer the question properly because like, what we ask ourselves, well, what do we do? But when you're in it, you don't see what outside is seen mm. from outside looking in. Mm. When you're inside looking out, it's not the same as outside looking in, obviously. I think as well, like, a lot of these exhibitions are good as well yeah. because Sometimes there might be people in here that didn't even know about grime, but when you yeah. see the exhibition, you'll be like, Oh, you can go and like research it and stuff. Because sometimes a lot of the questions I always get asked is like, What's where's grime now? Like, it's not yeah. as big and blah blah blah, and they don't know who done this and that. But grime for me is more than music, it's, it is like yeah. a lifestyle, it's, it's a definitely culture. a lifestyle, yeah. it's a way of living like the clothing, the way the kids talk, the way they act and, and everything. Even, even another everything. thing, so it's a quite another thing. See, Graham, like, everyone in it, we love it, but we didn't name it Graham. Yeah, we Jeez. didn't even name it Graham. We didn't. We Some didn't, but, journalists did. But yeah. it's the way it is, so we just keep growing with it. It's like, for example, I feel like key things, say, like, music right now changes, innit? Not a lot of people got patience to hear what you're actually saying. Mm. So people, I feel like people, there's more, like, documentaries, more, like, Things like this, exhibitions where people get to ask questions, mm -hmm. know the depth of what's going on, what they want to know, and then that's the only way we can grow and build, man. Yeah. 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 Thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> One more. Uh, no, at the back, man. I'm sorry, my brother at the back. He's been at his hand up. Last. No, no, right at the back, not you. Oh. Behind you. Oh. Pick me up afterwards, bro. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I was just traveling in Australia, and um, when people would hear the accent, um, they'll show you so much love. You know, you're from London, they'll wanna, yo, do you wanna come listen to this grime? You know, so I saw the impact of London culture, of grime in the rest of the world. Yeah. So my question is, how could we, because obviously all you guys there, we want to show the younger generation like, yo, your impact is bigger than your situation right now. Mm. How can we use that to kind of show them like, yo, you have a, a bigger influence than what the media is portraying you to be? Mm. I like that question. That's a good question. Mm. Young people, your impact is going to be way bigger than what you can see. Than what you can see right I think, do you know what? I feel like when I was younger, I'm just writing my experiences. I'm writing what I'm going through, not even thinking that it's going to have any impact. I get messages from people that wrote letters and stuff saying that my songs have stopped them from killing themselves and stuff. But I'm just writing. I'm just being me and just living in like my sure. moment and stuff like that. So I just think to anyone that is an aspiring artist in whatever sector you are, it might not just be a musician, whatever. You just gotta keep, just keep going, man. You just yeah. live your truth, whatever it is. You just yeah. have to live your truth, live in your truth and just keep pushing it and pushing it. For me, getting from where I was, like just this young girl living in Hackney in a council estate, to having my own TV show, to creating my own TV shows, to mm. modeling, for London and New York Fashion Week and stuff like that. These are just like Shoot. small little dreams that I had like as a kid that just got bigger and bigger and bigger. So I think you just gotta support the support the youth, man. Like don't don't like overlook them. Like just you have to give them support. Like my, my younger brother, he wants to do music and be a grime artist as okay. well. So I'm just like encouraging him, encouraging him because I know if he sticks at it, where he could get to, especially yeah. with me behind him, I'm going to be backing it. <laughs> I'm making sure he experiences some of the experiences Set. I've had and more as well. So I just think the youth, that's our future. Yeah, so, it, so like, it doesn't have to be a musician. It don't have to be sports. It could be science. It could be yeah, a historian. Man. It could be whatever. It's, just, a, it's a big world. Yeah, like, and just get behind thing them and add to that as well. It's like, if anyone does music or anyone you know does music, don't ever box yourself in. 
know what I mean? Don't let them marginalise your talent. It's like, mm. if you're from, <coughs> you actually make this genre or whatever, if you like music, express yourself because mm -hmm. you're from that culture, but that don't mean that, for example, you showed two songs that like, say Mainstream Money, Strider Man. Two different. It's two different things, but mm. I'm from Graham. Mm. That don't mean I'm going to say, I can't make that because that's what they expect because everyone I like, I like music. I like mm. how I feel. So mm. if you've got dreams, chase it, man. Don't and, feel held back. No. And you know what as well? I feel like some of the older generation, not all, but just just listen more to like the kids, the yeah. youth and stuff, because I feel like, you know, when you're young and you're passionate and you want to do this and you want to do that, but your parents might be like, no, 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 no yeah. you're going to school yeah. and you're going to do this and that. But I feel like we're at a time and age now. It's just like you can be successful in these things that you might not have thought they, your yeah. kids could have been successful in before back yeah. in the day. Do you get me? So I just think. Just support them, listen to them, encourage them. Obviously, yeah. give them like you know, mm. don't you can't do a madness, yeah. but like, <laughs> like let's I'm let's yeah. let's have a sensible conversation yeah. of what you want to do. Get behind them and then just support them. Like you get what I'm saying. Don't be mm. don't be afraid to express yourself. Yeah, mm -hmm. just support, and, man. And one more thing I would add to that is I think we're we're now moving to a time where we need our own institutions. You know, there's been so much knowledge shared, so much experience. And we've talked so much about the different things, the different functions that this music has in order to make sure that our young people can see how far it can go. To go back to your question, I think we really got to start institutionalizing some of this teaching so that it's not just you might catch it if you come to yeah. a one-off event. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah, 100%. True. On behalf of British Library, I want to thank everyone on the stage. Amazing. My colleague, Lima. Thank you. And George, the poet. And all of you who have been here tonight, amazing, great audience. And thank you so much for your amazing questions. What a rich and, and inspiring conversation, just the, almost scratching the surface. You still want to do that last question? Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, my apologies. Go for it. <laughs> Is it working? Hello. Yeah. All right. Cool. Um, thank you all for your time. Thank you. What I wanted to ask you was essentially what you just brought up last minute in terms of the institutions. You've mentioned how you help us and how each and every single one of you has pioneered something and created a space that was not here ten years ago, or twenty years ago, and created jobs that weren't here ten years or twenty years ago. So. How can the young people behind you assist you in that? How can we unburden you with that? What are the actionable things that we can do socially, economically, even politically, to help us protect this space and also grow this space? Yeah. So actual actions that we can take. The number one thing I would say is start using the music for more, because right now, um, everyone is like trying to get signed, trying to get money. I, I do understand that. But if you're able to use your music in a way that educates, in a way that documents important um, elements of our existence, that's what I've been trying to do with the podcast. That's why, I, like I said, I stopped just releasing songs. And I started trying to show the different things that that one skill, being able to rhyme, all the different things it can enable us to do. So hopefully you see the different directions we've taken it in. You sympathize with our position. We don't have an institution right now. We don't have a school that we can put you through. But... Um, hmm. Yeah. So, so that's, that, that, that's, that's, that's a real practical question. How can people volunteer... Um, develop internships, and that's the kind of thing that you, because we are from a creative community, mm. we're never too far from an artist where you can pitch that to. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, a lot, a lot, I know a lot of people that got on that way. I've worked with a lot of young people that way who just came up to me and said, look, I'd like to help with this. I'm good with that. Let me know. And we get it cracking from there. Yeah. So, yeah, that's definitely part of the tradition. Mm. Okay. But, yeah, thank, thank you guys all. Sorry if we didn't get to the questions. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll be signing books. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. <laughs>